I was born in uh, on my parents' farm, in fact, in the house back in uh, November 6, 1951. Um, I grew up, uh, went to school in Pine River, Minnesota, um, which I graduated from. Uh, we were a big family. I have uh, six other brothers, which I am the oldest, and two sisters. Um, my younger sister, uh, well, the youngest is a girl and the oldest is a girl. My older sister actually passed away uh, about four years ago. She had a lot of health issues. So right at this time, I'm the oldest. Um, I joined the Navy after talking to my uncle, my mother's brother. Um, and he came to visit us during the time he had off and showed us all this great trips he made and all this stuff. And I thought that'd be a fantastic thing, you know, for me to do. I wanted to get away from the farm life and, you know, just get out, get out of there, you know, do something. I really wasn't sure what I was going to do when I got out of school. And my parents couldn't afford to send me to any higher education at that time. So I thought I'd decide that the Navy would be a good adventure for me. Uh, my parents uh, weren't too happy about that at that point in time. I was, but um, after, and uh, I actually uh, physically joined in March of uh, a delay entry program, in March of 1970, uh, before I graduated from high school, and um, went to basic training on July 8th at uh, Naval Training Center in uh, San Diego, California for 13 weeks and uh, when I left there I went to uh, school, aviation school in uh, Millington, Tennessee which is about 40 miles from, from Memphis. I spent approximately um, six, well, not quite six months there getting the training I required to for go on to the squadron I was going to uh, in California and uh, my rate was aviation machinist made hydraulics which I uh, didn't uh, later on down, down down the road find out that I wouldn't even hardly work in it although I'd work with those people uh, when I got into the squadron in uh, the following spring I was uh, sent over uh, to the Philippines to actually replace another uh, person in that unit that was what they call uh, an army KP. In the Navy, they call it mess cooking. And it was a requirement at that time for E3 and below to do 90 days of that. Well, I had done about 60 days already and, uh, in the shore station and then NAS Lemoore. So I had to finish out the, the balance of that time on ship which uh, you're attached to ship's company and they think they own you at that time and I, uh, they decided I was going to stay there longer. But our leading chief petty officer, which is like a first sergeant, he got me out of there and got me back into the, the squadron. And I was able to work in the, in the Air France Division and uh, that opportune time I wanted to get on the flight deck where the a little extra money, you got hazardous duty pay, and you get to work in the open air, which I enjoyed. I didn't have, didn't have enough seniority to do that, so I just stay in the shop and work down below deck, which is just on the hangar deck anyway. But uh, I did get up on the flight deck a few times to work on aircraft and down during flight quarters, so you don't get the hazard duty pay. Um, once we got pulled back into San Diego after that first cruise I was on, which was a short one, um, I stayed in the Air France Division um, for a f time period. But I found out there were uh, short uh, plane captains in line division, they called it. So I applied for that job and I, I got it. And uh, I was able to move over to the line division. And uh, I stayed there the rest of my tour with the unit. Um, in that uh, position, I was uh, I moved up uh, to the rank of E4, which is a petty officer third class, and that's an NCO in the Navy. And uh, I became uh, we had a chief petty officer E7 that was in, in charge of us, and I became uh, 
the second in charge of, uh, there was 10 of us in the squadron. Although we had 14 aircraft, not all of them flew at the same time. A lot of them were down for various reasons. So this particular uh, aircraft I got stuck with was uh, the squadron commanders, and I stayed with that one all the time, uh, pretty much. Um, uh, plane captain's job is to maintain that aircraft uh, as far as cleanliness, uh, be aware what work is done on it, um, help the pilot into the cockpit, um, make sure he has everything he needs, uh, do a, a pre-flight uh, turnaround, they call it, to check the aircraft out. Um, Plane captain always also does maintenance turnarounds. You sit in the aircraft and operate it. It's tied down, of course, when technicians are working on it. And you operate controls for them. Aircraft actually runs, but it's, it's tied down. It can't go anywhere. So that was uh, my job also. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to work the flight deck on the, the two other cruises I did go on. Longest one. Uh, being in, from 71 to 72, or let me back up, 72 to 73. Um, at that point in time, uh, I was in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, on our first line period, and uh, we, they uh, decided to take uh, a group of people out of the carrier air wing and put us in an air base in, outside of Da Nang to support maintenance of aircraft that could not land back on ship on the carrier air wing 11, which it was called. So I got stuck there uh, for almost eight months and got off there twice where we got to go back on the ship when they come off the line and go back to the Philippines and then you fly back in there by helicopter and, and so during that, that's my time period in, in Vietnam. Uh, that was a naval uh, aviation support facility that was supported by all uh, aircraft or all carriers that came in there with uh, aircraft issues. And uh, it, uh, the amenities we have nowadays to, uh, for creature comfort weren't, weren't there at that time. The only conversation uh, or only uh, correspondence I had back home was letters. So usually that was probably about a two-week turnaround before I got one back, but uh, I survived it. It wasn't, uh, <laughs> it wasn't any fun, but uh, it was extra money. What were the typical aircraft uh, maintenance that you were doing? Being shot down? Or uh, uh, landing or uh, tail hooks, replacement, uh, any flight controls that uh, requirement to land back on the carrier. Um, a lot of them had uh, repash uh, holes that got in them from whatever they were shot at or whatever. So we during that. that tour it was just uh, uh, you're on the ship coming and going? Uh, that, that line or that uh, time at uh, Tonkin Gulf? Yeah, we were, um, they go out for a line period for probably anywhere from 25 to 30 or 40 days. It varied in length of time. And then they pull off the line. Uh, during that whole tour I was there, I only got off, uh, I was only back on the ship for two, two different times they pull off. And then we got liberty to go to shore. When I was, at the time I was at uh, Tonsonut, uh, they didn't allow us to leave the base uh, for any reason whatsoever. Uh, we were just uh, boarded by the Naval Air Facility there, and, and uh, there was only approximately, it varied from, there were probably anywhere from 15 to 21 people, and uh, just a small detachment. What was an average day like for you? Well, we got up to the crack of dawn, pretty much. On ship, um, flight quarters varied. Uh, sometimes you'd work the, the night operations, which begin at midnight and carry on into noon, and it shut down. Um, most time on ship, it's every day, uh, anywhere from 14 to 16 hours. Uh, can, and when at, during, that, uh, during that tour I was on, um, when I got off and got 
into Vietnam, yet uh, our days were, were a little less shorter, they weren't as long, probably most of the time it was daylight to dusk, and uh, we didn't want any lighting and working on aircraft after dark at all, we didn't want visibility. A lot of times uh, you get stray fire that comes in, they didn't want to work it on. We didn't have, most of the time we worked out in the open on aircraft, so there, we had a very minimal tools. All the tools that we used came with us, and we took them back when we left there. Variety aircraft or 18s or? Uh, we worked on F-4 Phantoms, worked on A-70 Corsairs, um, some A-4 Skyhawks, um, uh, A-5 Vigilante, which is a reconnaissance aircraft, A-6 Intruders. Um, some uh, P-3 Orions, um, I, most of those I just helped uh, assist wherever needed. I didn't do any of the technical stuff. I helped clean the aircraft, uh, fix things that were, you know, simple, like panels, and you know, put the stuff back on. We, uh, like I said, it was a variety of people from the carrier air wing and we helped each other. It's kind of a, a lot of cross-training, cross basically, what we call. So it, it was fun that way, but you know, it made the day go by a little better. But. So you got on the line, but it would have been better if you were on the ship? Is that? What oh, actually, uh, when I look back at it, I, uh, I, it was fun to get off the ship, actually. Uh, life on the ship was pretty you know, monotonous after a fashion. Uh, our, what do you call closed circuit TVs were limited to what you could watch. Uh, there wasn't many of those on the ship uh, in the quarters that we had. Um, uh, for the whole squadron had like uh, six or seven different quarters, I remember, depending on your rank. And only three of those quarters had TVs in them. So we were most of the time, I was only limited to two. And then you'd have to go send in somebody, unless you were in that birthing, they call it birthing compartment. You. Uh, didn't want you in there at all. So, so you read, laid in your rack, read books, whatever you get your hands on, uh, walk around, actually run on the flight deck, you do PT too, so take up your time, sleep, <laughs> that's about it. That's all, the time, yeah, that's all the time you had? Pretty much. Working 16 hours, yeah. Working long days, you yeah. gotta sleep whatever you can. Um, you're on call, yeah, what you can sleep, uh, the birthing compartment they had at that time that I was in was right below the um, right forward of the what they call the round down on the flight deck where the aircraft first hit. Very noisy. And there were also resting gear right above us too. So you had to listen to that whine of the landing back in. So you got used to it after a while. What were your living conditions like on shore? Uh, we lived in uh, a Quonset that were, I shouldn't say Quonset, but it's uh, partially in the ground, about three to four feet. And it's wet most of the time, and damp, you know, we didn't have any, they had these big hurricane fans about the size of that umbrella behind you, and one on each end of there, but no, no such thing as air conditioning, that didn't exist, of course. Um, it was, uh, the food for the most part is good. Um, a lot of times uh, there was a shortage of various things like salt, sugar sometimes. So, you know, when that, they're, hopefully they'd replenish that within a few days. That, that sometimes you go four or five days with Kool-Aid that pretty tarty tasting. I remember that. And the water was, uh, you know, it's a group shower. Our shower was in a tent set up. Uh, it's pretty, pretty rough living, you know, but uh, I look back at it, it's, I survived it. It's, uh, uh, the biggest problem I had was keeping my feet dry. That's, uh, that's something that stuck with me all my life, you know. So socks was, you get a good pair of clean, dry socks on. That, that really helped. So I, I developed uh, what they call, I guess I call it trench foot, you know, or uh, almost like athlete's foot, it seemed. And uh, your feet start peeling off, you know, and that's, that was the worst thing. 
uh, boots could never straighten it right. Had two or three pair of boots, and uh, you get them wet almost every day. You know, and hopefully the other pairs are dry, so you have a dry pair for the start of the next day. Uh, Always pretty humid then, or was very, it heat? Very, very, very hot. Um, okay. Yeah, I was probably, when I went in, enlisted in the Navy, I was probably about 155 pounds at that time, and I, and I think I was probably 160, 165 that I weighed, and you, you, you eat like no tomorrow, but you never gain any weight because they, you sweat it all off, you know. It's, uh, it was miserable for that, for that reason. You listed a lot of aircraft. Were they all Navy planes then, or were you doing cross? We, Air Force had some. Uh, we did have a, uh, a captain, a Navy captain, or excuse me, Air Force captain on board that was in the unit, uh, but he flew Naval aircraft. But we also worked on Air Force planes, too, that would come in and need some minor thing fixed. And for the most part, it was Navy aircraft. Very, uh, every once in a while. I think for the whole tour, there, there was probably only, I'm guessing, three or four that it would, uh, would come in and require something fixed. And uh, they had to land there. You know, that was their, their only choice, so. Amy's probably going to get mad at me. I'm going to jump forward just a little bit because I'm really curious about this question listening to you. Um, I had this conversation with uh, some Vietnam vets, and a uh, lot are happy the way that the military is being treated now. And since you've lived through both, uh, as a Vietnam vet, is that comforting to you, or is it a Yes, very spinning? much so. Okay. Um, when I came home, there was no hoopla or none of that, that, still that stuff going on. You just, you get out, you come home, and nobody wanted to hear about what you did, you know. Um, although I wasn't involved in any fighting whatsoever, you know. Um, it, they just, you know, just continue on with life. I just, uh, I was the same way uh, during that generation when I got out in 19 July, in fact, almost to the day in 74. Grew my hair long, I had my hair down my shoulders, had a beard. I, uh, I really didn't join North Dakota Army National Guard till 1979, February. And I still had a beard and long hair. They told me, well, you're going to have to cut that off. And I, I guess it was time for a change. So, <laughs> No, I look back at it as a good experience. Um, uh, it uh, kind of set me up for the deployment to Iraq and what I experienced over there. And, Although climate's a little bit different, it's some of the same living uh, when you look back. Comparisons are somewhat the same, although this day and time is a lot more modern. You know. Amenities are, of course, a lot better, but uh, I was able to get through every day. What uh, unit were you in? Uh, 142nd, 142nd, HSC 142nd. Uh, so uh, did you return to Bismarck or Fargo? Fargo. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was proud to be an American just... Well, yeah. Watching you guys come home, uh, you want to touch a little more on that feeling versus leaving? Uh, well, that feeling, uh, uh, I actually came home on emergency leave in, in, uh, after Thanksgiving of 2003, in fact, the day after. And uh, my wife had some issues uh, with her health. Uh, my son, uh, my youngest son, who at that time was so... Uh, probably about 19, uh, between 18 and 19, had some real uh, issues, and uh, we had to get through that. So they allowed me to come home for 30 days, and we worked on that. And uh, it, during that time, she had some surgeries, which corrected the problem she had. And, um, but in, uh, I flew back in, in uh, right the uh, day before New Year's Eve and got back. But when I, we come back in March, uh, we landed at Fort Carson. Uh, I was uh, in the last group to fly out of blood out of the 142nd. I, was in, I got left up there when uh, everybody else or the whole battalion went back to Eric John to, to uh, clean the equipment and all that stuff. And uh, there was approximately 200 of us. I was actually the acting first sergeant at the time. Um, we come back into 
Fort Carson on a C-5A Galaxy to what was that Peterson Air Force Base, I think, is there. And uh, go bust into Fort Carson, and it's all waiting there. Um, all the all the uh, support group from North Dakota, and uh, Third Major Job, and all the people who went back early. And the first thing they had for us was beer. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, then we started that process the very early that morning of uh, of uh, going through the what what they call um, not uh, let me think post deployment or whatever you call it, processing. And it was pretty fast and furious. Uh, and we got. Got uh, ready to leave. It was uh, it was a hurry up and wait thing. Hurry up and wait, and wait, and wait. And finally, we got on the got on the plane. Well, what I didn't know at that it was a it was a diverted uh, Northwest plane from Minneapolis that was was sent to Fort Carson to pick us up. And the reason I'm telling you that is my brother works for worked for Northwest at the time. And he was in the he was a supervisor up there that was talking to the pilots uh, in Minneapolis at the time that they were getting their, their briefing to what they had to do. And uh, he flew up to from Minneapolis here. A couple of my brothers, a lot of my relatives flew up to see us and uh, to uh, greet us and, you know, for the year we were gone. And he was going to try to get on that flight, but he couldn't make it. Uh, but uh, I was the, well, the, actually the chalk commander at that time. The group was flying back, so I got to be the first one off the plane. You know, so it was kind of a big deal. But uh, my son J uh, Josh was with me too. In Iraq. Yes, he deployed also. He's in, been in the guard for almost eleven years, and. Uh, we sat together on the ride back and talked about our the year we were gone and things that happened and how we were going to react because he didn't have the opportunity to come home. So, you know, it's, it's quite, a, quite a different uh, feeling when you get off the plane and all those people are lined up there to greet you. And uh, um, it's a lot to take in. It's, it really is. Uh, I look back at it. It was, I was just a, I was like a zombie, you know. No, you know, you got all these people here. Actually, I just wanted to get out of there, you know. But I stuck around. I talked to a lot of people. Didn't even know me. A couple of people walked up there and thanked me. A couple that walked up saw uh, Josh and me standing there. My wife and my other uh, oldest son, and youngest son, and uh, they asked who he was. I said, "That's my middle son." Oh, you were deployed together? Yes, we were together. Wow, they, they, that blew them away, and they didn't quite understand that. But, um, yeah, it was a great feeling. All those people there to see us, uh, airport full. Um, it wasn't the same back in, during Vietnam. There was, there was nobody, you know. When I, when I flew back and got out, uh, just my parents there to greet me. You know, and that was it. No, uh, yes, um, during a variety of trips I made home during the course of my four years in, you'd see that in the airports and various places. Um, they didn't want to talk to you. They'd look at you like, you know, you, you, know, you wear a uniform to, to go home and leave. And, um, a lot of times I'd change because I had, got tired of people looking at me like, like that, and um, I never was uh, physically approached with any issues, but uh, you know the, the the draft dodgers. You'd see those and those people. I had a few relatives that were draft dodgers, and they gave me a hard time. But uh, you just walk away from it, you know, let it go. Was it harder or easier having your son over there? I, maybe both. actually, for a while, it was harder because he had to work indirectly underneath me. And, uh, you know, I can't, you can't tell favoritism. 
um, which I tried not to do that uh, halfway through my tour, or not quite halfway, well, maybe halfway. I was promoted to my current rank in 03, and um, I actually had to step down from that position as uh, running a section I was in. So I got away from that and uh, did other things and st stayed away from the section for a long time. I didn't come back to it. I let the, uh, the guy taking over take control. So, Because we supported other units that were underneath the uh, 130th Engineer Brigade, which we were attached to and, uh, for maintenance reasons. And they'd come to me every day and want to know where I was. Well, this, this guy took over and you need to talk to him. Um, Did you get to eat together? Um, some supper meals or evening meals we did in the dining facility, but uh, most of the time he didn't eat breakfast. I'm a big breakfast fan, and uh, he wouldn't get up that early, you know. So, <laughs> not not real often. Um, the what? big holiday meals we had, we did eat together. Uh, so you're not seeing each other every day? Or oh, I saw him every day. I usually say, you know, say something to him or whatever, and he's busy doing things, and I am too. So um, most everybody in the section and the unit knew we were father and son. We had a lot of that, you know, father, son, brother, sister, whatever. Um, so when we first got there, it was it was tough, you know, condition. We were all wired up, you know. Once we got into a routine, it was, it was very easily to daily, you know, function. And, and, uh, but uh, you got to maintain, you had to maintain control. You, uh, like I say, I couldn't favor, you know, favoritism. Everybody's the same, you know, treat everybody the same. 